Hi, this is Dr. S. P. Asa from Mechanical and Industrial Department, IIT Roorkee. In the course of vibration control, we are discussing about <coughs> the design considerations in the material selection. So, in last two lectures, we discussed about that how we can do the sensitive sensitivity analysis, because when we are just trying to go for the design consideration, then we need to check it out that what exactly the sensitive parameters are there and how we can put the ranges of that according to the sensitivity towards the material selection. And we dis discussed almost all about you see that how you know like the, the viscoelastic features are there and all other features are there for consideration in that. And in the last lecture, again it was for the design considerations, especially in the material selection, but it was on the design specifications. So, when we are trying to see the specifications, then there were three main components which was discussed. One, the speed of response in which you see you know like the transient feature was mainly discussed and how do we get the you know like the settling time and the rise time prior to reach to the steady state that was discussed in that. And then the second was the stability feature, when we are going for the stability, when we are going for the specification part then we need to check the stability part of this system when we are just going with the design consideration. And third was there about the resonance, because whenever you see any changes are there, we need to check it out that whether we are trying to reach or exactly at the resonant condition or not by changing or by considering the design feature in that. And also we discussed about when the system is of multi degree of freedom system, which is the real nature of the system then how do we do the effective analysis by reducing the model or the uh, order of model. So, you know like all in all discussions, we simply you know like observed that whenever you see you know like uh, the design considerations are there, the things are pretty sensitive, especially when we are just choosing the material for our entire vibration suppression. So, now we are again extending the same design considerations in the material selection for vibration suppression and this design is basically for enhancement of material damping. Because we, we know that the material damping, the name is pretty simple, but the mechanism is somewhat more complex, because the more complex physical effects are there, which are simply converting the kinetic and the strain energy into the vibrates, uh, vibrating mechanical system, which consists of you see we can say a solid matter and then this kinetic and uh, uh, this uh, you know like the strain energy which is being dissipated is simply converting into the heat. So, that dissip dissipation is absolutely the feature of the solid state part or we can say the whatever the macro feature of this you know like the molecules, which are being available with the various layers of the material part. And in this section, since we want to enhance that part, so we need to see the studies of the material damping, which are being employed in the solid state physics as simply it guides us in the form of the internal structure of the solid solids are. So, the damping capacity of material is also you see you know like one of the significant property for design of a structure or any mechanical devices for suppression of the vibration and the transportation, we know that there is a clear transfer feature, this you know like uh, the tr uh, this uh, vibration signature or we can say the sound levels are being clearly transmitted at the faster rate according to the material chosen. So, say you see if you are you know like uh, involving some kind of mechanical resonances or the fatigue, the soft wall or any you know like the hysteresis in the instrumentation feature or any heating under the cyclic stresses are very common problems. When you are trying to design the structure and the mechanical devices specifically when the, uh, the material damping is one of the criteria for that. So, these are the critical issues which needs to be addressed while simply putting the material damping as a part. So, sometimes you see we can 
say that the material damping is one of the complex phenomena because it is not only coming by the intermolecular interactions, but also you see here whatever the structural features are there that also being one of the component in the material damping is. So, we can now uh, divide the three types of material that can be studied here. One is the viscoelastic material which we already discussed, but some part is to be you know like uh, incorporated here as well for enhancing the material properties for design consideration. So, we can say that the idealized, the idealized linear behavior generally assumed under this visco viscoelastic material is simply you know like uh, amenable to the laws of superposition and then the other convenient rheological treatment can be simply included in the model just to put an you know, like analogy in the analysis feature of the viscoelastic behavior because in that we have the viscous feature, we have the elastic feature and when we are talking about the you know like the overall part, the overall behavior of the viscoelastic material, it needs a clear understanding about the Newtonian feature of the viscous part and the elastic feature according to the we can say the Hooke's law. So, in most of the cases we can say the linear or the Newtonian viscosity is being considered to be a principal form of energy which is being dissipated and converted in form of the heat. But many of the you know like the poly, uh, this polymetric uh, uh, material whatever you see the poly, polymers are there or other materials they are being treated in such a way that the principal dissipation energy is always being forming in terms of the linear, the Newtonian viscous effect and also they can exhibit the elastic feature. So, that you see here you know like uh, it can be straight way compatible in the overall formation of the kinetic and the strain energy and then they are being you know like converting into the heat. The another component in this is the structural metals and non metals. The linear dissipation function which is generally assumed for the analysis of any viscoelastic material are not appropriate for you know like we can say as a rule towards the structural materials. Because significant nonlinearity is available when we are just choosing the structural part because we know that the strain energy and the kinetic energy which are being transmitted in which are being dissipated it is not a linear propagation. So, we can say that the nonlinear, the nonlinearity characterizes it is simply like with, with all characterization of this uh, you know like uh, uh, the entire material with the nonlinearity consideration. The structural material is always showing a high level of stresses and when these high level of stresses are being distributed in all the materials we know that the deformation or the strain energy trans, uh, uh, this transmission is not in a linear part of that. So, we can say that whenever we are just going with the structural metal and non, uh, this non metal the linear dissipation function cannot be adaptable in that. A further complications can be there you see with the stress and temperature histories with the material damping property. And because of that you see here the concept of the stable, the stable material in the viscoelasticity is one of the realistic feature of the structural element. So, we need to check it out <coughs> not only the stress and temperature histories of the entire material, but at the same time we need to check it out that whether you see under such high, high stress in like high level of stresses or under this uh, fatigue feature whether the system is stable with the consideration of the structural damping, this structural damping with the consideration of this viscoelastic treatment or it is unstable under this feature. So, that is what you see sometimes you know like the things are some somewhat more complicated with the consideration of the nonlinear parametric features towards the structural damping. The third is the surface coatings. The application of coating is to flat and uh, you know like uh, towards the curved surfaces to enhance the energy dissipation and that is what you see you know like this is one of the common feature where we know that we are just required to absorb uh, required to absorb the energy of that. So, 
either we have a flat surface or the curved surface, the application is to enhance the energy dissipation by increasing the losses associated with the fluid flow in any common devices, especially in the acoustical noise control. And these coatings are also giving some kind of advantage to the material and interfacing damping through their bond with the structural element. Because we know that when we are just applying the coating there itself, there is a clear bonding feature in between the surface of the coating and the main surface of the object. And this bond is simply giving a typical kind of we can say interfacing damping. Through that you see here, few of the energy can be dissipated with you know like uh, these kind of things towards the structural element. So, when we are talking about the material damping, the material damping of any macro continuous structure or the media can be directly associated with those mechanism in which the plastic slip or any flow or any you know like we can say the magneto rheological part or magneto mechanical part is being there or also you see we can say that they are directly associated with the dislocation movement of the macro you know we can say the molecules which are simply showing, if we have the fibrous material, which are clearly showing the inhomogeneous strain. Because you see, we know that whenever we are just considering the fibrous material, the distribution of the strains are not uniform. And certainly we can say that this is some kind of inhomogeneous behavior of such materials under the loading. So, when we are just talking about the you know like the macro, macro feature of these material damping, always we need to consider the various mechanism in that just like the slip factor, like the you know like what the magneto, uh, magneto you know like the mechanical features are there through which you see some kind of deviations are there. Even under the loading condition or the stress conditions, there is a dislocation movement is there which can be even put the plastic flow in that. So, under these cyclic stresses or the strain, these mechanism will simply lead to the formation of a stress strain hysteresis loop, which is nothing but showing a loss of energy under the entire loop is. And since a variety of inelastic and the elastic mechanisms are just operating under the same cyclic stresses, the loading and you know like the unloading feature is always being drawn a hysteresis loop, which is a clear indication of the loss of energy. So, here now, even with the elastic and inelastic nature or elastic or plastic nature, we have a clear mechanism where the heat is being dissipated in the kinetic and strain energy form, but at the same time it is being you know, like loses because of this hysteresis loop or in inelastic behavior during loading and unloading of the cyclic stresses. So, now you see the curve which, which I am going to show you has you know like uh, the, the two main features say OPA and AB coincide then certainly means when there is no hysteresis loops are being formed, it is a perfectly elastic material. And this perfectly elastic material is allowing the energy to be absorbed and equal amount of energy is to be released during loading and unloading condition. But this behavior you cannot anticipate during the real world problem, even when we have a low stressed cycles. Because we know that whenever the things are being happening, there is a clear deviation in the path of the you know like the absorption and the released feature of energy and they will certainly make a, even a small hysteresis loop where there is a clear loss of energy. So, the energy the damping energy which is being dissipated per unit volume during each cycle is simply if we are saying that it is the sigma d you know like whatever in you know like the stress limit is there plus minus sigma d and the strain limit is there plus minus epsilon d it is absolutely equal to the area, whatever you know like the damping energy which is being dissipated per unit volume during this cycle is nothing but just showing 
the area of the stress strain diagram within the hysteresis loop of this ABCDA. So, when we are just trying to see these things, what we have? We have a clear loop of hysteresis under the stress strain diagram. So, we can check it out. This is what you see the stress sigma d, this is epsilon d you see here. So, what we have? This is what the designed feature of that, like in both the category, whether we are just going in the tension or in the compression under any cyclic fatigue. So, when the, you know like the cyclic feature of the stress applications are there, you can see that even in the form of the tension feature or in the form of the compression feature in the back truck, we could easily form that even in the loading condition now, just you know like it is approaching from A to you know like B and when unloading is there, it is approaching from C to D. So, when you see you know like this is just forming a straight line feature A to just AOC, that means you see you know like it is a perfectly elastic material. But this is not always be there in any of the actual practices. There is always a formation of this A, B, C, D and then this entire cycle is clearly showing that you see how much you know like uh, the this, this is what you see the hysteresis slope that how much energy is to be lost during loading and unloading condition in the cyclic stresses. So, this is you know like the, the stress strain diagram typically we can say the load or we can say it is a load deflection diagram which clearly shows that when the material is under cyclic stresses, there is a clear loss of energy which can be you know like computed based on the hysteresis loop area under the entire curve in between the stress and strain. So, when an engineering uh, you know like uh, the structure is being subjected by the simple harmonic excitation force, which is nothing but equals to F sin omega t and you see you know like the induced force, whatever the induced forces are there uh, due to this application of the material F d sin omega t minus phi always being interacted right from the applied to the reactive forces. And the ratio of these amplitude means the exciting to induced force means the action and the reaction force is a function of exciting frequency. And we can say that this is something the ratio of this rho, this uh, ratio of this force, the act, you know like the applied force and the reactive force is nothing but the uh, this uh, amplification factor. So, when we are trying to discuss this amplification factor which is just coming out when you are or we can see in other term is the transmission you know like when it is just transmitting. So, transmissibility factor then we can say that at the resonance when this you know like uh, the reactive force which is nothing but the F d sin omega t minus phi the phase difference when this phi is 90 degree the ratio becomes the resonant ampli amplification factor. And this uh, you know like uh, we can say the resonant amplification factor can be denoted by A r and this A r is nothing but equals to F d by F g. The exciting this F d is nothing but equals to the induced force and F g is nothing but equals to the exciting force. So, the condition you see which we can show you know like uh, in the uh, later picture is simply showing that when you have a low damping feature when we have a intermediate damping feature and when we have the high damping feature, then how the amplification factor at the resonant condition is being varied. And we could easily figure out that the magnitude of this resonance amplification factor is simply varies over a wide range of various practices where a clear application of these cyclic loadings are there. Or we can say that this is even starting from 10 this ratio means the F d by F g, the you know like the induced force divided by we can say the excitation force and this ratio can be in the range of under high stresses can approach up to 500 and up to 10 within you see you know like the reasonably inclusive forces towards that. So, if I see that I could easily figure out that you see what is the A r means what is the amp resonant amplification ratio is and accordingly, accordingly we can say that what exactly the other features or other properties of the systems are. The, the limits are even sometimes you know like uh, just go beyond certain thing, beyond certain you know like things as if you are just considering an aeroplane propeller 
the cyclic stresses in is absolutely in the fatigue range and they can be displayed a resonant amplification factor is the maximum like in the 91. Under double leaf spring with the optimum interfacing of the slip damping can be observed even because you see in that we have a clear double leaf spring and even in that you see in like the damping the slip damping features are there even it has the amplification this uh, factor at the resonance is of 10. So, you know like uh, it can be you know like we can say that we can vary right from 1 to 500 or even more than that. So, amplification ratio can be calculated based on that. So, because of the wide range available here, we can simply consider an individual effect of these uh, application parameters. So, you can see that, that how the effect of material and the slip damping is there on the vibration amplification curve. So, now you can see what you have, you have a clear mass which is being associated with this particular bar of A. And then you see in this, we just want to see that what exactly you know like the effect of this pressure is there on the joint. And then you know like when we are simply applying you see that here the force which is nothing but the excitation force Fg sin omega t. And we can get you see you know like uh, the responses which is, which is being you know like uh, we can say the inducive force F d is nothing but equals to the F into sin omega t minus phi. So, this the, the ratio of the exciting force F g to you know like the spatially frequency at the phase angle phi 90 is always giving you see the resonance and this dotted line is clearly showing that what exactly the amplification ratio at the resonance is. So, in that we can simply say that this A r which is showing the resonance uh, this resonance uh, amplification factor is absolutely depending on the various parameter. The first what exactly the material part is there, what is the slip damping is there and what exactly you see the kind of application in which the cyclic uh, loading conditions are being coming towards the structure. So, when you see that the first curve which is just showing the A r 91 is nothing but the show of the small material and more slip damping. That means you see here as we discussed in the previous case when we are just going with the proper design of the airplane, we know that the amplification is quite used because the exposure is with the small material and the slip damping is even for the small. But when one damping is large with comparison to the other we can say damping then we can say that somewhat we can control the amplification because of the damping available at the material side. So, you see here the AR can be you know like straightway reduced half of that is up to that. And when you see both material and slip damping are just large enough to clearly control the entire features of the excitation just like in the previous case we discussed about the interfacing of the you know like uh, uh, these properties in the leaf spring the double leaf spring we could easily figure out that the resonance at this point is just you know like the 10. So, almost you see here the 90 percent reduction is there in the amplification by adopting a different methodology and the material properties in that. So, in defining the various energy ratios unit it is important to distinguish a loss factor of a specimen or a part which is having a clear variability in the stress distribution. And this loss factor which we are considering nita here for material should be having a uniform stress distribution. So, sometimes you see this is what you see you know like the complications are there that we know that you know, like when you have the specimen part in which you see the variable stress distribution is there we need to keep ns the nita s and when you have the uniform stress distribution we can simply keep the nita as it is. And as we discussed in our first case that there are three main damping features are there the total average and specific damping. So, for calculation of this loss factor we are simply going with the overall damping just showing the dissipation of energy in the entire specimen. So, we can simply define the you know like we can say the variable stress distribution for the loss factor and nita s which is nothing but equals to the overall damping 
which simply considered the overall dissipation energy in the entire specimen d0 divided by 2 pi w0 where we know that this is you see the overall damping the total damping in the specimen d0 is there and then if we are going towards the total strain energy in the entire specimen which is showing by the w0 is nothing but equals to now based on that how much strain energy is there since we are considering a uniform material so certainly you see it is showing the young's modulus elasticity under the newtonian feature so we have the integral of 0 to v0 half of sigma square by e into dv or else even we can convert this into you know like a, that how you know like a, the entire volume is being changed so we have the w0 is nothing but equals to half sigma d square the sigma d is nothing but you see you know, like the designed feature where the peak stresses are being there so sigma d square by e into v0 beta so we know that you see you know like uh, when we are considering the peak stresses uh, there is a corresponding in you know, like the uh, the parametric features are there which is simply reflected by the beta because we know that until unless if you are not going with the dimensional as this uh, feature then we cannot bifurcate the significant and insignificant features there so e is the young's modulus beta is the dimensional as integral whose values is, is spe specifically depending on the volume and stress relation which we discussed previously that beta is a simply the stress distribution in which you see we have the both the variation the sigma by sigma d sigma is the total stresses sigma d is the peak stresses is simply relating the specific damping feature per unit cycle per unit volume into the variation because you see this beta which is unlike one of the specific property is also showing the dependence feature on the volume and the stresses so we have d v by v0 divided by d sigma by sigma d into d whatever you see multiplied with the variation of this stress distribution is d sigma by sigma d and when we are trying to substitute these things into the you know like uh, uh, not uh, the uniform feature this the variable stress distribution for the loss vector then the loss factor neta s with the variable stress distribution is nothing but equals to e dd into alpha divided by pi sigma d square beta so here now we have one more parameter e is the young's modulus dd is the designed value means you see the specific feature where you see we are simply considering the damping dissipation of energy divide into alpha bar alpha and beta these are the two specific parameters and sigma d square is the maximum peak stresses relates to the dd part it's not overall damping now so we can say that if this specimen is having the uniform stress distribution certainly alpha and beta will be the same and the loss vector becomes now the neta and this neta is nothing but equals to e into dd divided by pi d square or we can say it is nothing but equals to the the non uniform stress distribution neta as loss vector into beta by alpha so we can simply find out that you see when you have other ratios like you see the relative energy damping then certainly we can simply find out that how the you know like uh, the uniform and non uniform stress distribution can be related and how these parameters where you see you know like uh, which are simply defining the stress distribution in the entire material can be specified accordingly means the beta and alpha values so when you have the variable stress distribution the loss vector neta s was there which was simply the function of the various parameters like beta and alpha so if i am saying the neta s is equals to 10 phi or it is equals to whatever the variation this del s by pi or even we can say the phi s by pi we can also equate for any specimen various you see the variety of specimens are there it is equals to the del w by wn or even it is the reciprocal phenomena of the resonant amplification ratio at and any you know, like uh, we can say uh, these uh, 
different type of the stress distributions are means the non uniform stress distributions are or even it is nothing but equals to 1 by qs or even we can say we can calculate as we discussed already the neta s is nothing but equals to edd divided by pi d square into alpha by beta so in these all variations it is clearly showing that there is a loss a loss factor in the material because of the dissipation part under the high you know like we can say uh, typically high damping certainly you see here we can say as under the high cyclic loading if we are simply putting the high damping it will simply signify the high loss factors are there in that so the tan phi which we discussed here is nothing but the loss angle which is simply computed here that the phi is the phase angle which is being there in the sinusoidal loading where the strain is lagging behind in, in, in you know like to the stresses because of this non uniform stress distribution so in we can straight away incorporate the effect of this non uniform distribution of the stresses in calculating the stress and strain feature in our this material towards the loss factor so that's what the dissipation factor is clearly showing here the tan phi and phi is always being there as a phase phase angle difference even we discussed about the psi over pi where psi is nothing but the specific damping coefficient which is being there according to the material property we also shown there the del w by omega n which is simply showing that what is the bandwidth is being there with respect to the natural frequency and you know like uh, when this uh, uh, the power is being dissipated through that means the energy dissipations are there we also like discussed about the resonant amplification factor and this neta s which is nothing but the non uniform stress distribu distribution loss factor is always reciprocal to that amplification we can also find out the sharpness of these resonance peak and the amplification which are being produced by the resonance in terms of q so this loss factor because of the non uniform stress distribution is the reciprocal of this q is so it has a clear impact of all these variables with consideration of the stress distribution in a uniform or non uniform way so now we can go straight way to the material properties that are closely related to this factor so we can say the phi is nothing but equals to the phi s beta by alpha the delta is nothing but equals to delta s beta by alpha or even the ampli this amplification ratio is ars alpha by beta so these various energy ratios unit as we are simply expressing with a corresponding specification the specimens are simply depending on the various basic material property like the damping young's modulus but also it is showing clear dependence on these two parameter beta and alpha the beta by alpha so the ratio beta by alpha is absolutely depending upon the form of the damping and the stress distribution or the stress distribution in the specimen because you see here if you have a uniform stress distribution and you see this stress distribution is absolutely linked with the linear proportion of the damping is then we have a uniform stress distribution and beta and alpha becomes the same but if you see the material is not showing a uniform stress distribution along with the damp then like the damping uh, properties of the material certainly we have a clear value of this ratio beta and alpha and due to that the various other properties like we discussed like you know like the sharpness of the resonance peak or the resonance amplification factor or even the bandwidth or even we are simply we were discussing about the specific damping capacity angle you see you know like in between the stress and strain they are straight wave form and they simply show their significance in enhancing the material damping because of these two parameters the stress damping function and stress distribution in the specimen so in this case generally you see we we simply you know like we have taken the average damping energy da 
the loss factor or the logarithmic decrement for the specimen is exactly you know like the same in such same material and which are being you know like subjected to the similar kind of storage ranges frequency temperature. But we need to check it out that how the variables are being occurred when the shape or the uh, or this uh, you know like we can say the stress distribution of the specimen is being varied. When these being the variations are there then certainly the loss vector is different for the, even the same material or even they are under the same stresses. So, we need to check it out that how these parametric variations are there in terms of the stress when they are just passing through the material. And since the data expressed as the logarithmic decrement and similar energy uh, this similar energy ratios are just you know like uh, uh, being uh, varied in the same way with the same kind of we see the specimen types and the stress distribution then we need to see that how the material is being chosen so that we can keep these ratio and you see these logarithmic decrement in the similar fashion and the ratio which is simply showing the beta and alpha is absolutely one of the important part because you see it is just showing the dependence on the shape which is coming out in like uh, uh, from the entire uh, the feature and the material property with the damping stress function. So, that is why you see here not only with the consideration of the specimen types and the stress distribution we need to see that what exactly the damping stress functions are there means what exactly the, in, the interaction between the damping and the stress at the molecular level. So, that we can simply you know like uh, choose the appropriate material for the damping feature. And in other case you see as we discussed in the viscoelastic material we know that the system is somewhat influencing according to the rate of loading and also you see you know, like during the loading and unloading ca calculation. So, generally we can say the strain is very large if the stress varies slowly and then you see here it, it becomes you know like reaches to the steady state feature you know like uh, in a very swiftly feature. So, among the material which exhibits the viscoelastic feature with the viscous and the elastic nature are simply the high polymers and the metals at the elevated temperature and there are many glasses, rubbers or the plastics which are exhibiting this. So, when you see a sinusoidal exciting features are being you know like there with the kind of viscoelastic material excitation, then we need to check it out the strain and the stress whether the strain is lagging behind the, stra the stress or not. If it is there that means you see there is a clear indication of the non, this non uniform uh, you know like stress distribution and accordingly the loss factor is coming. So, the phase angle between them which is always being there a measure of the lo this loss angle in some kind of the viscoelastic material and accordingly the stress can be separated into two part one in which there is a phase with the stress strain in the loading condition and one when you have a different feature towards that in any of the quarter. So, the magnitude of these components is clearly depending upon the material and the exciting frequency omega for even a homogeneous say if we have a homo homogeneous shear then we can say that alpha and beta the uh, this uh, we can say the damping and the shear function is become same means 1. So, alpha beta is same we can say this gamma which is simply showing you see that how the stress is being varied towards that is gamma 0 sin omega t we can calculate the total stress sigma is nothing but equals to the gamma 0 g dash omega sin omega t and g double dash omega cos omega t. The g dash which we already discussed about the storage modulus here and g double dash is the loss modulus in the shear feature. So, they are clearly showing the linear variation of the viscoelastic stress strain. So, you see here sometimes we can go up to you know like for the low cycle and that the viscoelastic material can exhibit again it may exhibit a linear visco a linear stress strain under the viscoelastic features of that. So, in this you see here when we are calculating the storage modulus or the loss modulus of shear for the viscoelastic material the stiffness of the material is absolutely depending on both of them. And then you see here with the g and g double dash means the loss and the storage modulus 
we can calculate the loss angle phi which is nothing but equals to 10 inverse of the certainly the loss modulus of shear divided by the storage modulus of the shear and we can simply get calculate the you know like the complex or we can say the resultant modulus because of both the feature g star is nothing but equals to g dash plus iota times g double dash. So, you know like it is simply giving the complex modulus of these viscoelastic feature even when you have the elastic feature under the Hooke's law and it is being constrained by the viscosity feature towards that and which makes you see the complex moduli. Then we need to go with the corresponding principal feature which can be straightway adopting the existing elastic solution within the viscoelastic range. So, the modulus of the linear viscoelasticity or we can say you know like uh, linked with the specific damping ratio in that case and we can simply you know calculate for a homogeneous material under the shear stresses and we can say the peak amplitude say gamma 0 is there then the energy dissipated per cycle per unit volume right, d was there is nothing but equals to 0 to pi omega sigma d gamma by dt into dt where the d is nothing but you see the energy dissipation per unit cycle per unit volume is nothing but equals to gamma 0 square which is nothing but you see like the peak magnitude is there the shear stress. So, gamma 0 square the shear strain sorry the gamma 0 square omega g dash sin omega t plus g double dash cos omega t into dt or we can say that this is pi gamma 0 square g double dash omega. So, this is the you know like we can say our the uh, energy dissipation in those things under per cycle uh, per unit cycle and per unit volume it can be clearly calculated with those particular features. And when we are going towards the controlling damping then we need to go with the two consideration the passive and active control and the passive control as we discussed already that it needs you see certain kind of the external material just to keep there and this simply involves some mechanical characteristics of the system either to be inherent or to be added to the control vibration. And once you define the characteristic feature of the vibration, then you cannot take the further feature in the passive part. So, that is why it is a passive. Once applied, it to be applied. And all the treatment which have been implied in this is simply adding the damping of the material, mass of the, fe the mass feature of the material or the uh, stiffness feature. And since these three, the damping materials weight and stiffnesses are nothing but the co key components of the passive vibration control. So, passive vibration control is always being included in the discrete devices like the you know like just like you see adding the shock absorber or so just adding some kind of features through that we can simply put the energy loss. So, material with the high mobi the mobile molecules such as the elastomers and all they are always showing a high dampered features in their molecular feature of the material. So, the damping control can be achieved by making the part out of the elastomers and the part of that can be simply added as the elastomers to the normal material and that part can be framed out as a composite feature. So, in, in these cases we can say that the intermolecular nature of the system and the outer feature the surface finishes both can simply provide the desired damping phenomena in this. And by changing the shape of the vibrating system by joining the system with other component you see here with the elastomers adhesive and all these things will certainly increase the damping feature in that. So, the solution which is reflecting the general methods in the damping was here discussed with the basic fundamental principle of the material that how we can enhance the material damping with the addition of these part. So, now like if, if you are saying that we require the system in which you see some additional damping is to be added to just control the vibration or the amount of vibration, we need to simply see that how the molecular features are to be added means at this molecular level how it is to be you know, like added so that it can dampen out the molecular movement when it is being excited. So, the most common type is just you see embedding just embedding the sensors as the part of to detect the vibration 
by you know like putting the piezoelectric devices or something like you see here and then it can simply in like extend and retract the responses to the sensor signals and then by that way we can simply in like put the counter attack to the vibration and such systems that require the electric power to supply to just act as a actuation anti sensing feature is just coming under the active vibration control towards that so these systems you see in like it can be straight away associated there in the fly the, the air fly and uh, the, this airplane and somewhere you see here or in the flight particular there there is a you know like drastic change in the vibration is there just in the automatic way and they are able to control these vibration without the penalty of reducing the stiffness of the aircraft part or by changing even their shape and some of the advanced active systems are also used as a signal from the piezoelectric devices to drive the actuator motors which can even make some minor adjustment in the geometry of the aeroplane components so that is why you see you know like sometimes when we are simply viewing the wind shape the the wing shape is being changed during the high turbulence to just optimize the five flight control so these are some of the actuations from the piezoelectric feature and when they are simply sensed and simply you know like uh, sending the signals accordingly the actuation features are being appeared in that there are various other methods in the active control just using the embedded fiber optics and these fibers can sense the gross vibration just like you see the electronic sensors are and these fiber optics can be monitored for changes in the cross sectional area of the fiber which can even cause the change in the light transmission and then can be indicated whatever the vibrations which are being occurring so these changes can be able to point out the actual location of the vibration the optimum location of the source of vibration and simply giving a tighter control than the usual possible whatever you see the electronic controls are so this is you see one of the significant criteria that where we need to go to you know like uh, choose you see here the passive or active control and the, the the significant criteria here means that you see here how we can enhance the material property which can enhance the material damping you see here and through that we can you know like control the excitation feature of the vibration so this was the introduction especially about the passive and the active vibration control because ultimately our theme was to see that what exactly the design considerations are there when we are simply choosing the material for our vibration control so now you see in the further lectures we are going to discuss about the passive passive control feature of the vibration what are the basic theories involved in that and when we are talking about viscoelastic material and other materials then how you see the location and when you see you know like uh, uh, the source of vibration which is being transmitted how we can deviate the path there itself so from the source or the path how the deviations can be there in the vibration excitation by adopting appropriate passive controller thank you